Hi, welcome to Convex, where we are celebrating experiment-driven marketing. Uh, my name is Samir Sinha, and I head the revenue function here at VWO. Um, you know, if there are leaks in your conversion funnel, then we would invite you to come to the VWO website and, and uh, give it a shot. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have uh, Lucas Vermeer today, uh, who is the director of experimentation and booking.com. Um, Lucas is a, is a great public speaker. And I've had the privilege to be a part of uh, one of his uh, one of his talks uh, as an audience. And uh, like I was mentioning to him prior to the start of this talk, it was very hard to hard to get get a couple of minutes with him to have a chat because he was surrounded with all the audience who loved his talk. Really, really glad and a privilege to have you, Lucas, with us today. Glad to be here. Thank you for your kind words. All right. So. Uh, Let's move on, Lucas. Uh, you know, so we, we, I'm very well aware that you are the director of experimentation at Booking.com. But for the benefit of our audience, could you please describe your responsibilities a little bit and what are the priorities that you're working on? Ah, that's a good start. Uh, so yeah, so I'm Lucas. Uh, I, I, I've been at Booking for about six years now, a little bit longer. Uh, and so I joined when it was a little bit more of a scrappy startup starting to become a bigger player. But now, now Booking is obviously a bit of a giant. Um, and my role as director of experimentation has been for the last five years to help the company uh, learn from customer behavior and to learn how to build a better product for customers. And to do that, we have our own uh, tooling and our own support function. Uh, and we have a group of people here who are building uh, our own experimentation platform. Uh, we started doing that uh, many, many, many years ago. So there was nothing available off the shelf that we could buy. And so we essentially have our own internal uh, platform. Uh, and I'm responsible for experimentation within the company in the broadest sense of the world. Uh, so on the one hand, I'm responsible for the infrastructure and the tooling that people use to run experiments. And that's what these people focus on mostly. Um, part of that is also what uh, methodologies we then implement in that tooling. So, so what sort of randomization functions do we support, or what times of what types of uh, uh, variance reduction techniques do we use, etc. Um, but also the metrics that are uh, included in the in the tooling. We have uh, we have APIs for for teams to create their own metrics, but we also have a lot of standardized metrics and then uh, measure impact of experimentation across the business. Um, uh, things like revenue and, uh, and return rate, etc. Um, and then lastly, my responsibility is around the, the training uh, to help people scale up so they can use the tooling and that they understand how experimentation uh, is used. I think sadly, it's still the case that experimentation is not very uh, common in the industry. So whenever we hire new people, uh, we often have to uh, start from the basics and explain to them why, why is experimentation important and, and how we use it as part of product development. Um, and as a part of that, I think training is, is one side of a, of a coin. I mean, you can, you can train people in the classroom, but then once they have these skills, they then have to also be able to, to, um, to apply them in a, a social contract uh, within the company. And so I, I think a lot about what culture do we have as a company that allows people to speak up, uh, to, to have debates or to challenge decisions that other people have made. And so more the cultural aspects uh, of experimentation. So to give you an example, um, one of the things that we work on is not a product at all. It is a, a program called the peer review program where people can sign up uh, to be part of a, a group of people who every week uh, get paired up with another peer reviewer to randomly pick an experiment that is run by a team that they don't know uh, and try to give feedback that is useful to the people who are running the experiment. So you read the description, you look at the variations, you say, hey, have you considered looking at this particular metric or why did you pick this particular variation or we don't understand how you came up with this particular uh, hypothesis. And so we try to encourage a sort of healthy debate amongst uh, product development teams without becoming a gatekeeper, right? We are simply uh, an enabler. Um, so that's the, the experimentation side of my, my job. Um, obviously, Experimentation is, uh, is, a, is, is a tool that we use, but it's not the only way that we do analytics. Uh, Booking is a very data-driven company. We, we do a lot of data analysis, uh, and a lot of it revolves around causal inference, which is a wider field than just the experimentation. Uh, and so I also um, um, play a part in that wider analytical community, reviewing people's work, uh, reading white papers, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, 
mostly around trying to understand how these changes that we're making and the products that we build influence the, the overall customer experience and how we can improve uh, the user experience. Um, and then lastly, I think my role is, and that's why we met at the, at the conference, is uh, to hire great people to come work for booking. Um, <laughs> because we are always looking for people. So, so, and, and it's, um, I think the best way to get good people to join is to show the good work, work that you're doing and to show the level that you're, that you're at. And then hopefully the people who are, are interested in this topic and who want to work on causal inference at scale, uh, they'll, they'll come to us. All right, that's terrific, and and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of nuggets there, uh, Lucas. I mean, the one that you mentioned, like the people, notes. yeah, yeah, I'm taking notes all the time. So I, I love the social contract and the peer review process that you mentioned. To be honest with you, um, I think uh, I think as far as the process is concerned uh, of experimentation, that's that's sort of obvious uh, with a few tweaks here and there. Uh, what's what's missing in the industry is that it's it's like a stop and start culture with experimentation right because people sometimes get started and then they are expecting quick results and when the quick results don't happen uh, they the the organization as a whole tends to lose interest so building a culture of experimentation and really tying it as a way of life almost right i, I think that's what you mentioned that it's almost a way of life at booking and you know and it's you know it, it's no longer something that you have to do it's the way of doing things yeah i think so and in this presentation that you saw at uh, conversion um the really what it boils down to is that it's it, it's almost pointless to run experiments if you're not willing to be wrong and and it's it's even more pointless to allow teams to run experiments if you're not willing to listen to what they then find. And so this puts an enormous onus on, on leadership because it means that as a director or as a CPO or as a CEO, you need to be willing to say, I think this is the direction our product should go, but I'm not sure, I don't know, and please show me how I am wrong, what assumptions I'm making that are incorrect. And this is a very vulnerable position to take as, as a leadership because you're essentially saying that you don't know for sure that something is going to be the right thing to do. And it takes, it takes a very special type of leader to say, what I think or my ego is less important than that this product is a good user experience and that users want to use the product. And to put your own opinions and ego below the data that the people in your teams are going to find is something that I, I rarely I rarely see. And I, and I think that really is the hallmark of an exceptional leader, that you're putting the cause ahead of your own uh, of your own ego. And I, I'm happy that's something that, that we have here, but it also is something that you have to protect. And so when I talk about cultural experimentation, that to me is included in cultural experimentation, because without that boundary condition, there's no point in running experiments. And, and that's, I think, when, when you say start and stop, I think what I see sometimes happen is that people say, well, we want the benefits of, of experimentation, but we, we're not willing to let the data change our minds. And that doesn't work. <laughs> they, or, or you want results without the diligence, right? Or, or you, know, yeah, you yeah. want results without having to fail for it, which is almost impossible, yeah. right? And yeah, you know, and, you're... And, 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 and that's, I mean, that's part of the, what I did the presentation uh, about. And that's something that is a recurrent theme in my, many of my talks and in the blog posts we put as well, is that I see a lot of people put emphasis on the value of experimentation as trying to estimate the value of the winners. And I, I think that's, that's, that's partially where the value comes from, but, it, but it's very largely missing a much wider point, which is that learning where you fail and what things customers do not want has tremendous value, right? Figuring out the things that people are not responding to, the, the things where you were wrong about how customers were using your product, or you were wrong about what they expected from you, is, is a extremely valuable thing that I cannot really put a number on, right? The, the six months I don't waste work, working on a product that doesn't work, what value does that have? And so this is something that I think gets lost in the, uh, in the rhetoric of experimentation as a value machine. 
uh, it, it's much more protecting against uh, doing the wrong thing. Yeah. And, and again, something that we see all the time, Lucas, because, you know, we have uh, in excess of a billion experiences of being optimized on our platform. Time and again, mm -hmm. what we observe is that people simply don't put in the diligence to plan and create a very data driven hypothesis and rush into experimentation, right? right? Based on some right, preconceived right. notions, based on the hippo concept, I think is, is so obvious. Uh, you know, we right, just right. see this all the time, all the time. And, and you know, and, uh, and despite all the evidence to the contrary, uh, you know, we, we continue to make the mistakes. So, so I'm curious how you feel about this, because this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. And, and since you run a platform like this. So I think in my mind, one of the things that's happened is that with the experimentation tooling that's out there now, it has become much more easy to run an A-B test to the point where it's almost so easy to run a, an experiment that it's easier than doing proper user research, proper QA, proper you know, journal, right. journal diary uh, studies, right? Draw in a panel, ask them questions. That's all too complicated. Let's just run an A-B test. Then. Yes, yes. Right? So, so, so partially, and, and I'll, I'll be a little hyperbolic here. You are responsible for this. <laughs> you, you, have cre you have created the incentive system where it's easier to run an A-B test than to, to do due diligence. Would, do you see any merit to that position? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll tell you what our, our take on that is. And, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I think, uh, see, technology in general is a double-edged sword. Right. Uh, you know, it, it, yes, the, yes. the power can the power is intoxicating and the power can easily be misused. And we have seen this again. We are we are we are stepping into the realm of philosophy, but uh, we, we've seen this uh, happen time and time again from VW side. Uh, Lucas, what, what we've done is we have integrated an entire platform and actually implemented something like a Kanban product project management dashboard into the system right, right. to really help right. people ease out so you know so people will not do what they find difficult so what we've done no. is we've made the process of doing creating the hypothesis really simple all right so you've yep. got an integrated user research and it's very very simple to look at that research draw observations aggregating those observations and and sort of putting them into a bucket of hypotheses uh, looking at some other websites, best practices that others are doing, again, capturing those observations in terms of screenshots, making them available, all of them together so that you can create a hypothesis. So we've really spent a lot of effort into making sure that this entire CRO process is automated and simple. However, at the end of it, it like, uh, the it system is like as good as the person using it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds a lot like the direction we've been taking. And, and it boils or it goes back to an earlier point we were making is that actually the mechanics of running an experiment and the methodology hasn't really changed for the last 80 years, right? The, the statistics is still the same. Um, yes, you have to be diligent about how you collect data. And you have to make sure that the data is legit and that your mathematical functions work. But really, that, those problems have been, have been largely solved. But the larger problem of helping people who are not scientists figure out how do I write a hypothesis? How do I find the right supporting evidence for a hypothesis? How do I figure out which metrics I can use to support a hypothesis? Right? All of these things um, also influence to a very large degree the quality of an experimentation process. But they're much more fluffy and they depend a lot more on the user. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing really is, is helping our users use the existing tooling better rather than improving uh, the tooling. And I, I, do, I do see other parties in, in industry doing the, doing the same thing. So I think everyone has sort of come to the point where we can no longer really improve the mechanics of the, of the tooling, but we're sort of, um, not to get too philosophical, but like, these tools are being used to optimize the user experience. Right? That's why we're doing it. We want to make sure that our products work the best for our users. And that's why we're testing our implementations. We want to make sure that they do what we want them to do. Now, at some point, we started looking at ourselves and started thinking of our own tooling as a product. And we said, who are our users? Well, they're the people who run experiments. How are they using the tooling? Do they understand what they're doing? And so at some point, we're turned around and said, we can apply the same methods and try to figure out whether our tooling is actually helping our product teams improve products in the way that we think uh, it is. And I think that was a really key turnaround moment uh, for us, at least, to think about, uh, about the product development in that way. Right, right. And another thing that, that comes to mind here is that uh, 
creation of hypothesis is not an individual effort. I mean, you spoke about the peer review process and really yes, yes. opening yourself. And, and that's something, again, that's something we've tried to incorporate in our platform, where I the know, process yes. itself, you can actually invite feedback from other users and you can comment yes, yes. and look at everything together. Uh, because again, something that we realize is that the, the more, uh, you know, to use your, uh, your word, the more, the more we can democratize it, uh, you know, this process, uh, the better off we all are and, and the better off our chances of, of getting a better conversion at the end of it, because that's what matters. Yeah. So I wonder what you think about this, because I've sort of had second thoughts about using, because I, I have a few talks and I have a, a paper that uses the word democratization in it, because I, I feel that at the time I thought it would, uh, it gives the sense of we want everyone to be able to use these tools. Uh, but then I realized that there actually is second meaning to uh, to democracy, which is that every vote is equally important. And and that sort of undermines the concept of being data driven, right? It, it doesn't matter how many people are voting for a particular result. The result is the result. Everyone can use these tools and we can have uh, open debate about what the results mean. Right. But it doesn't mean we get to vote on who wins. Right. It, it's not like 20 votes for A and 21 votes for B. So let's do B. That's not how this works. Right. I agree. And I, and I, I honestly, I like it because a, it, it gives, uh, you know, it gives everybody the feeling that this is not an elitist kind of a thing. Right. So for a very long time, it was very elitist, right? This whole thing yes, was yes. that it's only a specialist can do that. So I think I like the word because it democratized for me means that, you, you know, we, there are a set of tools, methodologies and insights available, which make it possible for just about anybody to really do it. Right. You don't need to be a booking.com to do a successful A-B test. You know, a, a very small travel and hospitality website can also uh, do it and, and almost do it to the same level. So I, I like democratize in, in that sense. I like the fact that uh, because democracy for me is transparency and debate. Uh, right. It, yeah. It's about everybody having a say. And I think in a way, uh, the great part about A-B test is uh, you know, the user gets to vote and, and the user. Yeah, that's, a, that's a hidden meaning, right? That's that's one I didn't point out. But uh, but the, the hidden meaning of democratization is that you actually let your customers vote with their feet on on what is the right product for them. Right. And, and I think this is one of the reasons really that Booking started running experiments is that we said we want to put the customer at the center. We want to give them a way to tell us what they need, what they want. Um, and we do that by, by running these experiments where we explicitly look at what is it that they are doing with these changes that we make to the product. And you get these really interesting debates within where, where uh, when you ask customers, they will say one thing. And when you expose them to experience, they will do another thing. And then you have this debate of, are we going to do what they say that they need? Or are we going to do with the things that will help them find exactly the right accommodation for them. And this, I mean, this is a nice internal friction. That, that yes, that yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think you have to walk a balance. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there is a difference between, uh, you know, satisfying a need and making people happy. Right. Yes. Uh, there is there is a difference. And I think, uh, you know, that's what A-B test helps you do. In the end, we are helping the customer find what they want in the shortest time possible and make the best choice. Uh, you know, that's... Yeah, an there's, a, there's an added complexity, I think, for, for a product like Booking.com, where, where really what we're selling is, is uh, an experience of staying at a property or experiencing the world, going out there and seeing different places. Um, and so in the wider sense, what we are selling is not on our website. Right, what we are selling is going out in the world and seeing things, and that's not going to happen on our website. Our website is only a tool to get you there. And so, what do we optimize for? Do we optimize for your experience of the tool, or your experience out there? And I think we should we should be optimizing for that second thing, right? We should be helping people going out there and experiencing the world. That's the thing that we should want to want to try to uh, encourage, and the um, that creates some friction between how, the, how important is then the experience of the tool itself, respective to the experience of going out there in, in the world. Right. Fantastic. G great. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll move on. There are some 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 questions that we have over here. So uh, mm -hmm. you spoke, you know, before again, this talk, talk started, you spoke about giving, you know, um, internal teams the accountability uh, and mm -hmm. and the ownership, 
right? So uh, just want to talk to you about the team structure that you have, uh, Lucas. I think the structure is very, right, very right. important. I mean, how do you how do you structure your experimentation teams? It's is it is it by product? Is it or do you have experimentation teams standalone? Uh, is that a matrix? Uh, you know, that that be something very interesting to find out. On the team level, they are they are very heterogeneous teams. So we try to make sure that every team has the right skill mix uh, to independently execute on their task. So we we don't want uh, a separate IT department and a separate design department, and that they then to execute they have to talk between themselves and there's management layers in between, etc. We don't want that. We want we want those people to be in the same team so that together they can execute against the mission. Um, the mission itself, uh, it really depends on, on the area. We will we'll have areas where we have a very mature part of the product that um, can be optimized uh, and so requires small step iterations, trying to find just those tiny things that are still wrong with it and to increment on that. But we'll also have parts of the product that are very large greenfield where there's a, a, a lot of unknowns, a lot of things that we, we don't even know what the product should look like. Uh, and there, they'll do much larger step uh, iteration, much bigger projects. Um, and then there's this uh, more, more fluid, less product-based, but more customer-centric uh, problem-focused teams that are attacking a very specific problem or a set, very specific audience where we know these people are struggling with the current product, but it's not going to be one small change that's going to fix that. It's going to be a series of changes along the entire customer journey. And so we'll build a team around this particular group of people and say, well, um, people who have dogs, I'm just going to pick that up, like random example, people who have dogs, they, there's probably lots of things or parts of our product that could be improved for this particular audience. And so we might build a team around this and say, go talk to some dog owners and figure out how they're traveling, how our product is not feeding uh, their needs and build some hypotheses on how we can improve the product for this particular uh, audience. Um, but again, that team would be a heterogeneous team. So, so they would probably have a bunch of user researchers, developers, designers, copywriters, uh, everything that they need to execute. Right, right. Like a like a mini project team in itself, so that you know, everything is uh, is sort of together uh, and and as they're contained, as contained as possible. Yeah, you, I mean, you want to minimize the dependencies between between teams so that these teams can really execute on their own without having to do a lot of uh, communication between them. Um, and I think experimentation is a nice enabler there because if you if you think about democracy and making things vi visible, then it should be visible what these people are doing, and that sort of um, removes the need for a lot of communication because I can already see what you're doing. I don't need to talk to you to understand what you're doing. I can see what you're aiming for. I can see what decisions you made. And so, so a lot of these communication barriers are removed uh, by having this sort of centralized uh, system. And I, and I think it also, also creates a platform for a common objective. The objective is ex experimentation, like you said, right? It's, it, there is the objectives not to do IT, the objectives not to do design, the objectives to get together, get the product out, get it in front of users and, and get real time feedback for it. The objective is to solve known customer problems. It's to go out there, to find something that users are struggling with, to solve it. And, but the, the challenge is that in this, in this field that we work with, we, we, there's, a, there's a barrier between us and the user and the barrier is the internet, <laughs> right? We, we cannot see the customer. We cannot talk to them uh, directly one-on-one, -on -one, uh, at least not all the time. And so whenever we try to solve a problem, what we're really doing is we're saying, it, we, we, we understand now what the problem is, and we're going to implement a solution, and we think that the solution solves that problem. And all the, that the experiment helps us do is try to is, is measure whether the solution actually does what we think it does. Absolutely. And this, and this, Absolutely. this seems trivial, right? And, 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 and so my background is engineering. I'm a computer scientist. And it's, um, I think it's engineering hubris to think that we know exactly what the product is going to do. It's something that by my very training is something that I had to overcome and understand that whenever we build a solution, it might not actually do what we think it does. It might not work. Very yes, well put. Yes. Very well put. So, um, one thing that I that we wanted to understand, Lucas, is uh, 
all, all of this is understood and again you've alluded to, a, to it a little bit how do you get this out to the people uh, within booking.com uh, sometimes what, what happens is there is again that energy to rush into a solution how do you continuously uh, convey to them that they need to do an experimentation they need to prove it uh, before they are able to put that solution in place so i get this question a lot and and to be honest i i don't really have an answer so, so rewind six years ago um i was a consultant not working for booking account trying to help companies understand that that this is a thing but this is how you need to operate right that that you have to validate in production that the changes you make have the impact you think they make and this is what i was trying to uh, to help companies do and i was making very little headway because i what i found was companies had already decided that this was going to be the product before they'd even even figured out whether that's what customers wanted right there's a lot of hubris of we already know what our customers want we only need to build it um and i had i think i've personally given up on that and then I ran into a man who worked for Booking.com, and we talked a little bit about the philosophy, the product philosophy here, and I realized that um, they already got it. And so really the reason I joined Booking.com is because I was looking for that and I found it here. Um, so if you ask me, how do you create that? I have no idea. Honestly, I don't. I, I, I think it's something that is, uh, that is something that I've spent my last five years here trying to protect to make sure that as we grow as a company, and, and really we've grown a lot, um, how you, when you bring in new people, how do you protect that philosophy? How do you protect that culture uh, and not lose it as you, as you scale out? Um, if you have a company that's already at this scale and that, that doesn't have this, I, I would really struggle to think how you would, how you would uh, teach people. But to bring it back to booking, the, the way of trying to do that is by, by doing a lot of classroom education. So there's a lot of discussion uh, groups that we have. So it's not this is not a lecture where I just talk for an, for a day, but it's a very interactive session where we discuss difficult decisions. We discuss particular examples of experiments where really the discussion could go either way. And I tell I tell the people in the room I tell them this I say look we are going to debate this experiment, and if all of you say A, I will say B. And I will be able to convince every single one of you that it should be B. But if all of you say B, I will say A, and then the same thing will happen, right? And also able to convince you. Because this really is like in the middle. And so we can, we can have debates either way. And what is important is not that we make the right decision here, but that we keep the customer at the center of that debate. And we have a, a, a good way to discuss what it is that this experiment is doing and why we think it's good or not. And think that is something that I've really tried to to encourage, to encourage debate, and uh, to encourage openness uh, within within booking. Makes sense. So, uh, you know, a, a, a very well known fact is that you probably run hundreds, if not thousands, of concurrent experiments um, at mm -hmm. booking.com. Then, you know, how have you designed the infrastructure for it? Um, you know, that's a, it's something that comes to mind because people generally struggle with a few ends of concurrent experiments. I think the answer is. Uh, it's taken us 15 years, right? And maybe five iterations, six. So, so this is not something that you build from like from the get-go, right? The first version of our experimentation platform 15 years ago, the maximum number of experiments was four. It couldn't support more than that. And we, we actually didn't think that we would ever need more than four. Um, I wasn't there, by the way, but so I have all of this on hearsay. Um, but the reality is that you build a platform for, for four and you learn along the way all of the ways that that's going to break. And then you scale up to 40 and then you scale up to 400 and then you scale up to 4,000, I don't know. But every, every time you scale up, you learn about what are some of the things that are breaking and how, we'll, how we will avoid that uh, next time. Um, so this is really a, a, an iterative process. I don't think what we have now we could have built or designed uh, from the get-go. And, and one of the things, and this is also in the democratization paper, actually, we described this. One of the things that has really been a step change for us is the fact that we have uh, two independent data pipelines. And so we, our, our, our infrastructure um, 
has lots of redundancy built in on purpose. And that allows us to double check all of our own findings. And this is a, like an instant bug hunting machine. Because the moment that the two uh, sources of truth disagree, then there must be a mistake uh, somewhere. And we, we use this to actively hunt for discrepancies. And we don't see those as, as problems. We see those as opportunities for improving. Right? So, so we've taken this really as a, as a way of improving our internal data pipelines and thinking about why is it that these two different methods disagree and how do we make sure that they don't disagree uh, going forward. And then you just, you just build like incrementally. On top of it, yeah. On top of that. Uh, right. Yeah, until it breaks. <laughs> until it breaks and then you reboot from scratch. Yeah. Then, you, then yeah. So, so I think iteration, uh, really making making yeah. small small changes, seeing what will work, and then adding on top of it rather than trying to do like a big bang approach, uh, all in one kind of a, a kind of a thing, right? I I'm gonna say it's very similar to the way we build our our product as a whole. Right. right. It's it's you look at how people are actually consuming it, what they're actually doing with it. You look at the things that are actually uh, stretching and and not scaling, and you attack those rather than start from first principles and then build something that's perfect, you go with what are people actually using? Uh, what are things are actually making a difference? And then you invest on, on those. And we do the same thing for our internal products as we do for our, uh, our own product. If we, we have landing pages that are just there to see how much people land on them. You spoke in between about, you know, keep doing it till it breaks. Um, and, and that sort of rang a bell in my mind because I hear a lot of uh, people who are who are not using A/B testing or conversion optimization, and uh, worried about doing it because they think the user experience will break. Uh, you know, and, and I've I've heard them say this a few times. Uh, what would be your message to them? Uh, you know, why, people who are worried about the user experience breaking when they deploy a test. I remember this uh, this talk from Craig Sullivan at some point, who. Uh, who said his dirty little secret for CRO was that he would just find bugs on websites and fix them. That it really wasn't that complicated, that you just find a, a product and you find where it's broken and then you fix that. Uh, and, and then my, my, he showed an example of a website where if you clicked on a particular link, then the entire website was unused. I think it was opening the gallery and the gallery couldn't be closed anymore. So basically the entire website becomes unusable at that point. And your only option as a user is to close the browser or tab and open a new one and start from scratch. Right, and that's that's clearly a broken user experience, and it makes you wonder how did that ever end up on that website in the first place, right? Because if this was an A/B test, if you if this new feature was launched as as part of an A/B test, then immediately you would have seen that well, this is weird. We added a new gallery, and no one is buying anything anymore, right? So so immediately that would would make alarm bells go off, and you would reconsider implementing that. But the fact that they that they had this on the website makes me think that it wasn't part of an A/B test at all. So so. I mean, you're, I, I think what you mean is that people are afraid that rapid change will break the user experience, right? That, that change your product frequently, which something that often comes with A-B testing, is that people will try lots of different things. And I think the concern is that that's the thing that's going to break the user experience, because now it's uh, inconsistent or whatever um, term they use. Um, but I think that's a, different, that's a different problem. That's a problem of uh, rapid change. It's not a problem of experimentation. I think even if you make few changes, you can still use experimentation to make sure that they're not breaking the user experience. Uh, in fact, like I said, I would argue that if you're not running A-B experiments, you have a bigger risk of breaking a uh, user experience because you're not actually checking uh, whether user experience is broken. Um, I think experimentation helps you sort of limit the audience which will be exposed to that error. So I said, instead of exposing it to the entire audience, then you do an A-B test, then you're at least limiting the people who will be exposed and, you know, an early warning system, if you will. Yeah. I mean, so, so we wrote a blog post about the circuit breaker, which is a system that we have internally that automatically stops tests when users see uh, error pages. And, it, and this to me is the, and this under the hood, it runs A-B tests. Right? But there's no uh, user or developer involvement here. But it means that as a developer here, if you write a new feature and you put that on the Booking.com website, and within the first second of exposing it to users, we see users see more 404 pages or more 500 pages. Basically, the product becomes unusable. Then we say, we cannot conceive of a situation where this would be a good thing. Like, there's no way that 404 pages are going to improve the user experience. And so, 
at that point, we automatically pull the plug and say, I'm sorry, this is not good. Go back to the drawing board and, and you know, reconsider how you're implementing this. And that's only possible because it's an A-B test. Um, and so this, this to me is a huge value of, of this, this way of development is that you actually protect the user experience and you protect users from, from mistakes that we are inevitably going to make. Because right? obviously we still have QA, we still have testing, all of these things we do, but it's still possible that a, a piece of code hits our production servers that just doesn't do what you expect it to do. Right? Every day, every week in the news, you see some website that, that breaks. And I wonder, like, could this could this have been detected earlier if there was a if there was experimentation at all? Yeah, yeah, and and just testing uh, just doesn't do it because it doesn't expose uh, that situation to a wider variety, and there is no real sampling involved. I think sampling is so much important, and that's where A/B test is better than your conventional dev or or otherwise testing. Right? Would you agree? I think you need both. You need you need both. It's not either or. I think I think there is a. Um, there's a huge value to testing things before you put them in production because it gives you a tighter feedback loop. You, you get more immediate feedback as a developer when the CI pipeline breaks, right? When you're doing continuous integration, you push something in production and the pipeline breaks and says, this is what's wrong. This test has failed, right? So that's, that's better than not doing any uh, QA uh, testing. However, um, there are, will always be limits to what you can test in this way, especially if you're building new products. Right, because they, these test suites they are designed to make sure that the product still does what it's supposed to do. But it, when you're changing the product, you're changing what the product is supposed to do. Right, right? and so and, and you have some assumptions about why that's good, right? So if you think about, let's say, uh, uh, changing uh, how a certain button uh, works, or how it change, whether it uh, does it open a new page or does it open a new modal, right? Then at, at the Integration level, you, you can test whether indeed, instead of opening a new page, you now open up a new modal. But you cannot test whether actually users understand that that's what's supposed to happen, whether users will then respond in the way that you think they will, or whether they just close the modal, assume it's a cookie box or whatever. Um, and so you can test more of the technical aspects of your change, but really not the behavioral ones of how people are going to uh, perceive uh, this change. I think that's the, that's the core here. And, and QA testing will never be able to do that. So, so I think you will always require both uh, QA before production and something in production, be it A-B testing or anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, th I think great point you make about, uh, you know, not being able to test the behavioral aspects of the, of the, of the, of the change, right? If we knew how people were going to behave, we wouldn't have to test it because we already know what people are going to do, right? Then life would be so easy. Life would be so easy. And, and I think I, it, it was also connected to the point you made earlier that, you know, we may not even be the representative sample. So who are we to decide whether the change is right or not? You know, uh, right, there are right. so many, uh, so many websites where the intended audience is not, not us at all. So for us right, to right. Uh, think that we know better than the users is almost arrogant. Yeah, and, and, I mean, so it's good you bring that up because I think it's one of the, the things I like about working here is that um, Booking has realized this and actually very consciously has tried to make the mix of people in this building more representative of our users. Right? We're a travel company, right? People go all over the world and we know that uh, uh, assumptions are going to be different uh, across the world. The way currency is displayed, as a very simple example, is different across the world. The way taxes are interpreted is different across the world. And so in this building alone, which is our, our headquarters here in Amsterdam, I think on the sixth floor, there's 100 plus nationalities in this one building. And that's, and that's not on, by accident, right? It's a very conscious, deliberate thing for us to say, we want as much diversity as possible in our internal space. So as many different people with as many different backgrounds within this building, so that we are more representative uh, of our user base. And still, you're right. We are not a full representative sample of the people who use Booking.com. There's lots of people who are uh, retired uh, and traveling a lot. This is, it's one of the progress of being retired that you can travel more. Uh, yeah. Usually. Yeah. Uh, but those people also won't work for Booking.com because they're retired, right? So we will never have that particular segment of users in this, in this building. And so we still need to validate that the changes we make uh, are, are relevant to that, uh, to that particular audience. Great thought. Great thought. I, I think it's, it's very difficult to, be, uh, to have global customers 
unless you're your your self representative of it like you correctly mentioned so it, it's very interesting that that diversity is is really by design uh, you know and, and it's a conscious decision to 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 be so yeah. Yeah, we say diversity gives us strength, and we we honestly believe that this is one of the of the things that makes us uh, a strong cultural uh, company culture, in in the sense that we have so much diversity that we actually get challenged on these assumptions every day. I think if you have a monoculture where every has the same uh, background, you don't think about these things, right? You don't you don't think about uh, that someone might interpret your your copy or uh, your photos or the colors that you use. Uh, in a different way, uh, and I think I think that's one of the great things of, of being here. That you actually get challenged on that, and you go like, "Oh, oh, that's not normal. Other people don't think this is a thing. That's so." And first, you go like, "That's weird," right? But then you reflect on it, and you go like, "No, wait, I'm weird, right?" This, and so this, I, I, my background is Dutch, so, so this is my my home country. Um, but uh, but uh, most of the people who work there are here are not Dutch, and they like I get questions every once in a while like, "Is this?" really what people do here and i go like yeah yeah that's that's how we and it's the simple things right like uh, how you celebrate a birthday S silly things where you go like well obviously you all sit in a circle and you shake everyone's hand to say hello and then you eat cake and then you go home before dinner right that's that's how you're supposed to celebrate a birthday but apparently that's a very dutch thing and no one else in the world celebrates birthdays that way right and so now i now i feel weird right and but that's good i, I think it i think it's it's a it's a wonderful thing uh, for for people to travel, and that's also I think why I like I like booking as a as a product because it's helping people go out there and actually see that people across the world are different, and I think that would make the world uh, a better place. Yeah, uh, when there is more understanding and more openness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and that goes back to your earlier point of you want to create this open culture where people can ch can challenge each other, and for me, that's also something that I want in the outside world. I want people to travel. And to realize that the way they do things is not necessarily the only way uh, to do things and to talk about these things to have open discussions about uh, how you celebrate birthdays or what is delicious food or how you should spend your holidays or what is your relationship with your mother right all of these things are are uh, uh, subject to culture uh, and the best way to to realize this is to, is to go out there to travel and, and to experience Absolutely. So, uh, Lucas, we we also did an internal poll on on a few questions that uh, that could be uh -huh. asked, and, and I'm going to go run through a couple uh, here. Uh, so, you know, okay. one of the questions was, uh, you know, are there any f further challenges uh, that you see when your company is running experiments? Um, any 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 other challenges that we haven't covered so far? So, one of the interesting things that we're looking into now is uh, there are cases where you cannot run uh, AB. Uh, simply because you don't have control or because of legal constraints or ethical constraints or you know, some reason that you cannot flip a coin and decide who gets to see A and B. Um, and there are methods to deal with that. Uh, we, we've written a paper about them and we have a blog post coming up. Um, but um, they're not as easy. And so how do we scale them in the same way that we scale A and B? Because I mean, we could, we, I mean, my group is not that large. We're about 30 people. Um, but we could treat those cases on a one by one basis with smart people. I mean, we have smart people, but then we would be spending an enormous amount of time just doing the analysis and that's not, it's just not going to scale. And so we have to find ways to take like the scaling that we've applied to AB testing and apply it to things that are not quite AB testing. I think that's one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we're running. And you see this also actually, uh, in the wider experimentation community, if you look at things that uh, other San, uh, Silicon Valley companies that write, I won't name names, but other people write about A-B testing as well. And if you look at what they're writing about, they're not writing about basic A-B testing. They're talking about, can we do time series prediction? Can we do uh, inverse propensity weighting? Can we do heterogeneous treatment effects detection, et cetera? So I think that's, that's some of the fun stuff that we're we're butting our heads against it. All right, makes sense. Um, so another another uh, thing that comes to mind is, uh, you know, when you have responses to one type of exp uh, one type of experiment, uh, you know, how do you how do you make sure it's independent of another uh, another response and the two are not really related? Uh, are the two right, related? Right. Are the two uh, are the two independent of each other? How do you make that judgment? There's a great blog post by uh, Georgi Georgiev. 
do you know this man? He, uh, he, he wrote a very long post uh, about this particular problem. And I think, uh, I think it's important to realize that interaction, interaction effects are real. So, so it's possible that two uh, experiments conflict uh, in some way. Um, so that, that this is not something to be disregarded. Um, but the flip side is that um, they are also something that, in some sense, if it's very bad, it's very easy to detect. So if there's very severe interaction effects between the two experiments, you can very easily pick those out. There's, there's simple statistical methods for picking them up. Um, but a much, much larger problem would be if these interaction effects are, um, let's say, solved at testing time, but not at production time. And what I mean is that a, a solution that is often presented to this problem is to isolate tests, to say, I'm going to run uh, half of my traffic gets one experiment and the other half gets the other experiment so that there's no way that they can interact. And, and surely this solves the interaction effects at testing time. So, okay. What happens when both of those tests are then winners and you ship them? That means that you now put into production two tests that have never been tested together. And so if there is an interaction effect between them, you've only moved the problem from the moment that you run the test to the moment that you put and this is much, much worse. I'm, I'm actually much more worried about that particular scenario than, than former because, again, um, if the interaction effect is, is very bad, it's relatively uh, straightforward to pick it up. Um, and I think as long as you, as you keep those constraints in, in mind, um, most tests will not interact. Uh, when tests do interact, it's quite easy to, to detect. If they do interact, it's quite easy to avoid. Because um, all you would need to do is create a, a multivariant test, right? So instead of running A, B, and A, B, I run A, B, C. Right. Right. And I've now I've isolated the test, but I also make sure that I can either ship A, uh, either A or B or C, but never the two things together. Together. Right? Because they could play. Right. So, and, and that's, this is fairly straightforward to, to do once you have realized that they interact, which you will only uh, be able to do if you overlap uh, the test. Right. And I think the biggest challenge that you correctly said is if you don't realize the interaction during testing time, but the interaction becomes apparent only at production. And that's a, uh, how do you address that? I mean, you know, the way you were saying it, it has happened to you in the past. Uh, how, how did you address it? <laughs> it uh, so we actually don't, uh, so I, I don't personally do. Um, I've heard of cases where this happens, but, but usually what happens is someone starts a test, notices that, it's absolutely terrible in terms of results or it generates errors and it's automatically stopped. And it goes, that's weird. That's not what I was expecting. That didn't come out of QA. They investigate and they realize it's a conflicting test. So this is something that people do uh, almost automatically um, and that doesn't really require intervention from us other than basically giving them insight in how their test is doing. Sure. Another thing that comes out for our customers is, uh, is data quality as, a, as an issue, right? And, and again, something that we've spoken, uh, spoken earlier uh, in, in this discussion, where, uh, you know, for you, one of the things you've put behind you is the validity of the data or the validity of the approach and the validity of the methodology. Uh, again, as it relates to data specifically, do you have any pieces of advice for our customers where data quality is an issue? And I think one of the reasons that we can validate our own data pipelines is because we own end-to-end -end the entire thing and we feel responsible for the entire thing. And then we have two of them. So we don't just have one in-house system, we have two in-house systems and we compare it against each other. Now, I, I don't know how you would do this if you were relying on a, on a third party. I realize the cost to doing this is enormous, right? right? Enormous, so, so correct, this, correct. This validity, this validity comes at a price which at our scale and our complexity is worth it, I think. Um, but if you're dealing with a third party and you're really concerned about data quality, really the only thing I can think of is uh, have two third parties compare results, right? And, and, and I'm sure you'll come out fine when compared to competitors. But as a, uh, as a consumer, I would probably want to see how these two different platforms deal with my data, whether they, they agree or disagree. And they're for sure they're going to disagree. Right? That, that's, that's 100% sure. Yeah. But you have, you have to find out where does the disagreement come from to understand which one you trust more. Yeah, and then I think a lot of our tests are actually um, could be replicated even if you're using a third party uh, 
tool. So we, so we have a new paper coming out actually last month, uh, three key checklists for online experimentation together with uh, Microsoft, Alexander Fabian, um, uh, was the first author, uh, which has very simple checklists of how as, a, as a, an end user of an experimentation platform at in inception during runtime and at decision time, we have checklists that you can run through to, to make sure that you're, uh, you're making reliable uh, decisions. And I don't see why those checklists couldn't be used uh, when you're dealing with a third party. They, they would work just as well. They, so they include simple things like, uh, did you decide upfront how much uh, runtime you're going to uh, run the experiment and how much visitors you would need and what you expected outcome was uh, to statistical tests that you can do even if you don't control the underlying infrastructure to make sure that the data that's coming out of the experiment is, is valid. Uh, you, you just mentioned a blog, which is which is great. You in fact, you mentioned a couple in our discussion. Are there any other blogs or podcasts that you would recommend to our audience as it relates to online experimentation? Any favorites? I actually don't listen to much uh, blogs or podcasts. I, I, I tend to keep an eye out on uh, other companies that have their own internal experimentation platforms so there's a bunch of big players uh there was a summit back in december with uh with the 10 biggest ones uh and so we do a lot of knowledge sharing between these companies and i i watch out for their blogs to see to see what's up but usually then i reach out and, and ask them directly um but in terms of podcasts i don't really have anything when people ask me here like what should i read I, there's a great book by gerber and green on, it's called field experiments which is really geared towards psychology and uh, political science students on how to do controlled experiment. It has some nice practical examples from non-online space, and I, I recommend that because it's a it's a nice introduction to the statistics and the methodology behind the experimentation. That's not too daunting, uh, so so I would re recommend uh, Gerber and Green field experiments. Yeah, it's not a simple introduction, Got but it. it's good. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. We we'll definitely go through it. Thank you. Um, and uh, Lucas, finally, uh, if uh, what, what is the preferred way uh, in which our audience can connect with you? Oh, um, probably reaching out by Twitter is the easiest. And uh, my Twitter handle is just at my name, my full name, Lucas Vermeer. Uh, but you can also we can also just go to my website, uh, lucasvermeer.nl. There's a form you can fill it out. I'll email you back. Um, yeah, that's probably easiest. All right, well, that, that's that's good. Terrific. Uh, can't thank you enough, Lucas. We are right on top of our time, and I have great insights, uh, amazing insights. I'm very thank sure you. that people will really benefit out of it. Thank you so much for your time and participating in Convex. Thank you, and nice talking to you.